In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Today's collect is one of those wonderful compositions which tends to roll past you in a rumble of wonderful melodious abstractions. The glory of the eternal trinity, the power of the divine majesty, the worshipping of the unity. But if we break it down into its grammatical components, essentially what's being said is that we have been given grace for two things, to acknowledge and to worship. That is, to use our minds and our hearts. This is a feast not just about concepts and ideas, theological notions in a book. The Feast of the Holy Trinity is to do with the engagement of our whole being in dedication and devotion to God. We're given grace to acknowledge the glory of the eternal Trinity. Our minds are enlightened and enlarged so that we can see that the pattern of God's action is threefold. We can see that God's action is an outpouring, that God's action is a responding, that God's action is a sharing. That's what it means to be God, to give, to respond, to overflow. That's the reality that's all around us. And our minds need to recognize that's the kind of God we believe in. Not a God who's at the other end of a very, very long prayer chain, the God who's a very long way away, but the God who is constantly giving, returning, bestowing. And that's something which our minds need to get hold of as Christians, because our minds, like the rest of us, are infected by the kinds of selfishness and laziness that are part of the inheritance of fallen human beings. So our minds need grace. They need liberation to see that God is like that. But that action of the mind is only part of the grace we are given. We're given grace to worship in the power of the divine majesty to worship the unity. It's a remarkable phrase, really. It says that the power of God works so as to draw our worship, not our submission, not our humiliation, not, so to speak, the grinding wheels of divine power crushing us like some kind of celestial steamroller. The power of God's majesty, the extraordinariness of this threefold life draws our worship. We adore, and when we adore, we delight and we enjoy. So the grace we're given is a grace that enlarges the mind and delights the heart. Both of those equally true when we think of the mystery of God, when we think of the mystery of God as threefold love. Let's think just a little bit more about that second dimension, the power of the divine majesty, making us able to worship the unity. What is it that really amazes and delights us about the Trinity? Well, so the collect seems to say, it's the unity we perceive. Because here is a unity of absolute difference. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit eternally other to each other. And yet, they are one. They're not one because somebody makes them one. They're not one because somebody imposes a single agenda on them. They are one because what each loves and delights in and longs for is what every other delights in and longs for. The Father longs for and delights in what delights the Son. The Son longs for, delights in what delights the Father a major theme in St. John's Gospel. The Holy Spirit delights in being the Spirit of Jesus, drawing us into communion with the Father. And so the Holy Spirit delights in the Father's longing to draw us into fellowship and intimacy with himself. So this is a unity which is not just abstract. 
It's a living plurality of persons fully, unreservedly delighting in the delight of the other. And that is something which might very well draw our adoration and our joy, because frankly, it's not the way we work most of the time. We tend to think of our own desires as almost inevitably, necessarily, being obstructed by the desire of others. To get my way is for somebody else not to have their way. In the deepest of human love, and the most authentic kinds of human community, yes, we can say that to some extent, we have an inkling of what it might be like, really, to desire what the other desires, to desire the good and the joy of the other. But most of the time, that's not how it is. In these last days, we've been reminded pretty brutally once again of what a divided and rivalrous world we live in. We've been reminded of the horrific abiding reality of racial injustice and prejudice, the bigotry and the violence that sustains division in our world. As if we needed reminding, yet we do, because we airbrush this from so much of our consciousness so much of the time. At these moments of crisis, public drama, it's harder to forget them. And painful as that is, we need to be reminded. The world we're in is not a world where we see a unity that we can delight in with amazement, with worship and adoration. And so if we open ourselves to the reality of being born again, as the gospel says, if we open ourselves to the promise of God's action among us, what we are opening ourselves to is the glory and the beauty of that unity. We are to discover something of that freedom to love what the other loves, knowing confidently that the other loves what we love, without being absorbed in one another, reduced to one another, overpowered by one another, we fully and freely discover our own joy in the joy of the other. That is the eternal reality of the unity of divine will and divine love. Our own lives will never be more than a pale approximation to that. And yet the life of the body of Christ is that kind of life as we're constantly reminded by St. Paul. And it's only in that unanimous and yet diverse delight and joy that we become fully ourselves. Think of the extravagant, almost surreal imagery of today's first reading. That breathless evocation of a heaven in which diverse voices constantly interweave in a great celestial polyphony of difference. Think of those four living creatures round the throne, those extraordinary mythological figures so hard to envisage, which John the seer draws from the language of Old Testament prophecy, especially from Ezekiel. The first beast was like a lion, and the second beast like a calf, and the third beast had a face as a man, and the fourth beast was like a flying eagle, and the four beasts had each of them six wings about him, and they were full of eyes within, and they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, holy, holy. That, as I say, almost surreal diversity of praise, joy, and exuberance. And as that polyphony of worship is raised to God in all eternity, remember too the four and twenty elders around. When they worship, they cast down their crowns before the throne. They throw away any pretense, any symbol of power and dominance, and they give themselves over to delight. They cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honour and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. Twenty-four elders casting away their crowns, their privilege, give themselves over into recognizing that God made the world for joy and that in our worship together, 
in that polyphony of difference, we discover fully the joy for which we were made. Oh yes, this is indeed a feast for mind and heart. The mind recognizing that extraordinary baffling unity in difference that is the life of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. The heart discovering the miracle that that unity is in practice. The miracle of shared joy. The miracle of joyful love which delights in the well-being of the other, which unites with the longing of the other. We beseech thee, we prayed, keep us steadfast in this faith and evermore defend us from all adversities. We need to have our inward vision clear, as Aquinas says in one of his hymns. We need the mind to be steady in its recognition of the unity of divine action in the Father and the Word incarnate and the Spirit of Jesus Christ. And we need defense from adversity, defense from those things within us and without that make us take for granted the exercise of power and privilege, that make us blind to injustice, inequity, rivalry in our world. God has given us grace by the confession of a true faith, a recognition of what is most deeply real, to acknowledge the glory and to worship the unity. And so we pray that our minds and hearts may be renewed and enlarged and enriched by this vision. As we celebrate this great climax of the Christian calendar, where we've seen the story unfold, We've seen the story unfolding from the promise of God in Advent to the coming of Christ, from the coming of Christ, the passion and resurrection of Christ, from the passion and resurrection to the ascension and the sending of the Holy Spirit. We've seen God at work in all the diversity of divine agency and divine presence involved there. And now on Trinity Sunday, we step back, take a deep breath and acknowledge that diverse glory and we wonder at that unity in plurality. And we pray that our lives may be held steadfast, both in faith and in witness, now and always. Amen.